Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, such a nice warm welcome to these fantastic Strauss Zoom talks. So Sophie Louise and I um, are going to talk about the Curiosity Cabinet. And the first slide that you're looking at is the most beautiful cabinet which we have on our forthcoming sale. It's um, a black japan and chinoiserie decorated brass mounted cabinet. The exterior is probably uh, Antwerp or more Middle European. It has Japanese uh, engraved mounts. And when you open the doors, there is this fantastic arrangement of Japanese lacquered drawers. Um, the stand is European and gilded. Um, so you have a mixture of different styles and lacquer work and from different countries and different nations, but it seems to all work very well and there's harmony. So the question is what would be in those little drawers? And that is where collectors housed and looked after their precious treasures. And if you go to the next slide, Matt. So what you're looking at here is the, um, earliest Italian engraving from the 16th century, which is an illustration of the first natural history cabinet. So if you look, and I hope you can see on your screens all the most extraordinary things that are in this particular natural history cabinet, you've got um, horns, dead fish, skulls, uh, bones, little bit pieces of furniture. It's, it's quite a, an eclectic taste. And um, if one thinks about it, what is a cabinet of curiosity? And I think perhaps we'll deal with the term as originally, it described a room rather than a piece of furniture. Uh, modern terminology would categorize objects, including, including belonging to the natural history, geology, archeology, span religious and historical relics, works of art, antiquities, and these wonderful collections were the precursors to museums. So if you think of the British Museum, this is really how it started off. They were privately owned collections of extraordinary objects of esoteric interest. And it's in a very broad uh, subject. It has been vastly written about, and there are many documents and theses on it. The first period of collecting is the 16th century, the middle of the 16th century to the 17th century. And there were classified themes of uh, preserved animals, horns, tusks, plants and shells, which is what you saw in the Italian engraving. The second period of collecting is from the mid 17th century to the late 18th century. And that had a slightly different grouping. It was more interested in natural history, freaks of nature, man-made wonders, demonstrating the artisan skill, showcasing the opulence of materials involved from gems, gold, ivory, rhinoceros horn, ethnographic and exotic materials, and in particular, scientific objects. So wealthy collectors took advantage of an expanded world through global trade, exploration, and colonization. And a well-stocked collection was the key to improving one's social, social standing in society and enriching one's knowledge. These collection, collections said something about the self-identity of the collector and their view and understanding of the world. Princes and doctors, merchants and clergymen all worked very hard at their curiosity cabinets. So the display of wealth and the stimulation of intellect and to entertain and celebrate the wonder of God's creation were really the cabinet's objectives. So from there, um, we go to the 21st century and bearing in mind what Vanessa has just talked us through, um, if we were to take one example, um, if in those days I would have had a stuffed parrot from Papua New Guinea in front of me, I would have been looking at it probably together with other intellectuals as well so it was a way of coming together as well but I'd be using probably all of my five senses I'd be looking at it I'd be touching at it um, I might even smell it 
And so it was a very engaging process with the actual object, regardless of what the object was or what material it was made of. And um, in today's world, if we think about it, we live in this global village. Everything is suddenly being interconnected. It's instant. If you look at children, for example, most of them have a cell phone. They know exactly how to work the computers. They're better than their, um, their elders often. And we've become so used to having information at our fingertips. Um, and the question is, are we really looking through that process? Are we actually engaging as you would have engaged in the 17th century, for example, or taking it further when, when the first museums opened up? Um, remembering that museums were also a, a meeting place. Um, post uh, the war, especially in America, they were also a place which was um, a way of bringing together people in, in a very positive manner, which was obviously needed at that time. Um, the introduction of lunchtime concerts, uh, walkabouts, talkabouts, all of those engaging things to bring people together, to share knowledge, to, to better yourself, to raise your standards. Um, and then if you put that in context to today, if I want to know about a bird in Papua New Guinea, I just go onto Google, I put in bird Papua New Guinea, and it throws back a host of information at me. Um, from what the bird sounds like, I can hear an audio. I can watch a video of it in its natural inhabitant. Um, I can Google what it eats, what it had yesterday for breakfast. I don't need to dissect the thing. Um, so I can even buy one if I wanted to and have it delivered. So, so it has really the, the focus and the way we interact with each other, with objects in particular, has changed whether we like it or not. Um, and the point in, in, well, case in point on the next slide is um, a lady called Natalia Taylor. She is one of the um, Instagrammers, she uses social media um, quite frequently and, and that's how she's established her platform of communicating with the world and, and as we know these platforms all have hundreds of followers. So she, what she did is she posted pictures of herself on holiday in Bali and she had 28,000 plus people liking this. Um, and why am I showing this in a lecture that's about objects and an auction house, etc. Well, the point of the matter was that initially everyone posted these comments are fabulous. Where are you? Well, I love it. I'd love to be there. You know, um, probably people that you hadn't met as some of you know, and she didn't know from Bob Soap before. What was interesting is that when later on people started clicking that this was actually staged, and in fact, the pictures are taken in an IKEA store <laughs> with the photographer in hand, and on the right hand side where the arrows are, you can actually see the labels. All of those indicators were in those images. But it's quite interesting how in this modern world, we actually have forgotten to look to a great extent. Um, and also how the brain, is, which brings a whole other subject we won't go into, but the brain is this amazing tool that actually negates or doesn't, it blocks out certain uh, visual, certain information. So when you're looking at that, you're geared to look with what your preconceived ideas. But when you're actually forced to look at something, and actually understand something and grasp something, that's actually when you will see indicators like that, for example. So that's just a modern day version of, are we looking, aren't we looking? And that's a question we'll take you back to right at the end. And there is no right or wrong answer, rest assured. <laughs> You're all entitled to your opinion. But um, moving swiftly along, we will go into what are these artifacts that you, Vanessa, will take you through and what were their uses. So over to you, Vanessa. Thank you, Sophie Zoo. So we're looking at three very small objects. These aren't in our sale, but they are curious objects. They're actually three scent bottles. The one on the right is a little mice and porcelain scent bottle in the form of a dog. And the central one is glass with a beautiful gold mount, which has been embellished with cabochon turquoise. And the one, the example on the left-hand side is of cone shaped and it has a little scent bottle inside it. And these were these beautiful objects that people wanted to own, wanted to look at, enjoy. They put them into their curiosity cabinets, which they would unpack and they would look and discuss and, ha and learn about. The second uh, examples we have here are the silversmiths were extremely busy throughout the 17th, 18th and 19th century. And they embraced novelties and strange objects. 
these are pretty obvious that you can see that, that we have the two tea caddies. Uh, one's in the form of a jockey's cap and the other's a shell. And we have a lovely pair of sugar nips. And on the right hand side, you have use of tortoiseshell for a fantastic pair of spectacles um, and some skates where you would have your pins. I mean, all of these objects are not in use today or would not have been, uh, would have been in use then. So this is, um, you're probably looking at that and thinking, good Lord, what is that? This is another view, these are beautiful objects. They are hollowed out calabashes and they were used to drink the traditional South American drink, mate. The straw in the front is called the bombilla and that was made of silver and gold. So you can see craftsmanship with the exotic. And this I included as just a fun slide. Um, the little object on the right is a Chinese cricket cage. So of course you put your little cricket in there and he sang away happily to you. And once he, <laughs> once he left this mortal coil, you put that precious object back into your cabinet. And on the left hand side is a very nice whistle in the form of a dog's head. It's probably European, but also an object that would never be used today. It's fairly obvious, but if you had seen the little object on the right, would you have ever uh, questioned that it was a curiosity and that in fact was a cricket cage. So we have stopped looking and that's what Sophie and Louise and I do all the time. We examine objects. Um, if you ever pop your head into our office, there's a, a, a long discussion going on about um, either the condition or the period. And um, I'm going to now uh, take you, we're going to take you into the VOC, the property of the collector, which I'm going to give so over to Sophie Louise. Thank you, Vanessa. So yeah, property of the collector is our first collection um, in session three. And if we go to the following slide, you can actually see um, oh, okay, so we're going to start with the history of the VOC company, which was founded in 1602, and I'm just going to run you briefly through it. Um, so the company itself was a combination of commercial organizations in various cities of Holland and Zealand, and traded mainly um, in Asia, and then obviously between Asia and Europe, and it was one of the first companies that brought in um, negotiable shares, so very much like a stock company um, was trading um, market today. Um, it ran its own shipyards, and of course, we all know it was um, one of the biggest uh, concerns um, that was founded. The, what the VOC did is basically built up a network of bases, um, Then these range from offices to warehouses um, to commercial buildings. And the center of the VOC trade at one point was Batavia, which was um, also known as Jakarta on Java, which was established in 1619. Um, Jan Peters Kuhn captured the port, and um, I will refer back to that later on in this lecture. Um, why was that specifically that location important? Well, it was the home of the Governor General, who was the highest VOC official in the East Indies, and so a lot of the major um, decision making would have happened there. If we go to the second slide, we'll, the next slide, we'll see a picture, a photograph of one of the vessels. So um, these were built to be quite large. And the reason for that was um, that they combined cargo as well as um, ammunition for battle. And of course the holes had to be big enough to transport um, various cargo. And it took them about eight months to do a, a trip um, at an average of 13 kilometers per hour. And that was considered to be quite swift and a good speed. And along the route, they would set up all these various trading stations. And of course, you have to think about all these people on, in one confined space, as it were, there was no social distancing. And so discipline had to be rather severe and everyone was kept um, neatly in their, in their boxes. And of course, hygiene was a huge um, problem for them. Over to the next slide. In 1604, the, so that's two years after the VOC was founded, um, the trade began with India. And most of what they brought back out of there were the spices, so salt, pepper, nutmeg, cloves, and cinnamon, um, as well as fabrics. So chintzes, cotton, silks um, were all quite sought after in Europe. Um, opium was traded with Java, 
and um, the Japan, Japanese produced gold, silver, copper, and porcelain, and China also produced silk, porcelain, and tea. And then for a short period of time, there was even a trade in elephants, which um, they were exported from Ceylon um, or Sri Lanka, as we know. And with the Japanese, what is quite interesting is that the Dutch were the only Europeans committed to trade in Japan for two and a half centuries. And all of this happened on the artificial island in the Bay of Nagasaki. And the only time they actually got to see a little bit of Japan is when they went to thank the shogun um, and offer gifts. So it's quite, a, I mean, it's, there's so much more to it, but that's just a broad background to the VOC um, and how it came about. And then here's a map which just shows you, gives you an overview of all the different routes. So it just gives you an idea of how vast this network really was and um, how extraordinary, actually, if you think of those times. On to the next slide. So the next slide shows at some of the pieces that are form part of property of a collector. And you might ask, why did we include a slide with some of these objects on? And it's really to just give you a sense of um, looking at a collection and is it, is it a defined um, coherent collection in terms of has it got a specific viewpoint or a specific narrative that runs through it or is it a rather wide um, all encompassing uh, collection that that specific collector is looking at. So with the VOC and the CAPE that all comes from one collector, the CAPE chairs I should specify, um, and as you can see it, 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 kind of, it makes sense, it, it all reads quite well together, so it's quite a specific field naturally, but it's also a very, um, it's a very concise collection I would say. So in this collection, if we go to the next slide, we have these amazing Arita um, dishes, and I think Vanessa you would probably know a little bit more about them because um, you have handled them before and they've done exceptionally well also in the past, haven't they? Yeah, I, I can say quite proudly that Strauss and Company hold the, ro the world's record for the most expensive VOC dish that has ever been achieved at auction. Um, I think it was 650,000, wow. which was a world record at the time. So we've got three examples and um, they're really each one, they're very similar in size, and they've, they're similar in their decoration, obviously. Um, the firing, there are nuances and subtleties, which um, Sophie Louise and I always look for. It's the definition, the heaping and piling, which we discussed in the Chinese with a lecture last week. And it's obviously, Matt, if you could go back a few slides, um, yeah, that's super. Um, we look at the back and sometimes they're wonderful labels. Uh, this has just got the straightforward barter stamp. But we also study the condition. There's crazing, a few hairline cracks. And if one bears in mind that the main trade between um, the VOC and the Japanese in these Arita dishes was between 1660 and 1680, these dishes have, despite a few hairline cracks and, and crazing, um, they're still in terrific condition. So um, we've got the three there and various prices, um, but they be, the estimates do represent the condition of each plate. Mm, I think that's always so interesting is when we look at condition as how that affects value and, um, and all the ins and outs around that. Absolutely. Um, so the next slide um, is a Chinese VOC dish. So uh, the, the Dutch East India Company started, had, well, had been trading with Chengdu and they resumed their trading in the 19th century. And there's a complete difference, a different hand and a different palette. There isn't that looseness, that depth of deep, deep blue. The, the, the blues on this example are almost floating on the top. And if you look at the reverse, which is the next slide, Matt, you can see there's, if you bear in mind what we just looked at at the Japanese example, which had its spur marks, this doesn't have that. It has a very sweet label that says VOC sold at Christie's. Um, and 
everything about it is really much, much later. The foot room, the, the loose decoration of the bamboo, it's nothing like the examples that you've just seen from the 17th century. So th this collection has some fantastic examples of Chinese VOC. And so this, this, this dish would have been part of a larger dinner service. It's got the VOC monogram. And um, there would have been a lovely dinner service of probably 60, 80 pieces and all in use. And then the next slide, uh, Matt, these are these very, very rare table bay plates, um, which are from the, the Quanlong period, which is uh, 1736 to 1795. There are these almost naive views of Table Bay Harbour and one can go down to the castle in Cape Town and view some of the most beautiful examples there. But there's, um, you've obviously got the, ja the Dutch uh, vessels in the front and you can see that this is quite a, and the background is quite naive. This example has been restored but it's still rare to find it. So the estimate represent, uh, that, that's in the catalog really represents the condition. And Sophie Louise? Uh, yeah, so this is the example I was um, going to refer back to from when I introduced the VOC and have a brief overview. So this is a, what we call a commemorative plate on the left, look here on 57. Um, it's got the VOC monogram, it's got the crest, it's got the date, and so on the right is basically a um, an image of the battle of or the port of Jakarta after it was um, captured. So what's quite interesting, I mean, this plate is not in compared to the other plates um, priced very highly or dearly, but it just forms a nice it's a nice add in if you are a collector, and it just shows also that when you are collecting, you're not only necessarily collecting high value, you're augmenting with smaller values, but it all adds to the history of what you are specifically interested in. So if we go to the next slide, there's the man himself on the left, and on the right there's a statue of him. And of course, um, with the statue, it brings about this whole notion of uh, putting art in a public space, and the question which is quite relevant to South Africa or was relevant to South Africa but is ongoing um, with colonization and are these statues still relevant today and that is another question that will leave open-ended and carry on from there so over to the next slide these are just some examples of what are in the collection as well so we've got these coins I think they're 56 in the lot different coins and the following slide should show the the ink ignot um, and these all come from a wreck which is called the Breedenhof and that went down in the Mozambican channel in 1750, 17, sorry, 1753 um, and these were all salvaged from that specific wreck. Uh, the ignot for example was um, comes off the Christie's provenance as well and then moving into the chairs, the Cape chairs, yeah, the, you, yeah they, these are absolutely extraordinary, belonging to the same collector. So he has uh, kept his collection in the 18th century, uh, from, from the 17th century right through to the, as Sophie Louise mentioned, that early plate. But he has these fantastic Cape chairs, which would have um, obviously been expensive at the time and are extremely precious. The one on the left is the Queen Antique and Yellowwood corner armchair. And the one on the right is the Cape Transitional Talbuck Stinkwood side chair. And they both belong to um, the uh, Herbert Prince, who was a fantastic architect in the Johannesburg area. And they were originally sold in 1997 and have co are coming back into the market now. So they've been in this particular collector's collection and um, we're lucky enough to be able to sell them now. They really are very, very rare chairs. The one on the right is particularly nice for me as well because it's got those face masks. Absolutely. And I, yeah, it was one of the first times I've seen those masks on which flank the back really. Yeah, they're really, really super examples. 
very little restoration, alteration. They were in their original state as best they could be and um, beautifully looked after. Mm. Well, that brings us to the next collection, which is the late Rona and Graham Beck collection of the Kangaroo Group, which is well limited. Um, and of course, they were the founders of that group. Um, the Becks don't really need much introduction. Graham Beck Wines um, obviously belonged to them. They were entrepreneur. He was an entrepreneur. They were big into horse racing, and he was a coal mining magnate. So, what does their collection look like? Let's have a look. So bearing in mind that these pieces were fit into their home, and um, you're looking at a different type of collection. One could say it's quite a, a wide approach to collecting, but being collected for a home, it makes complete sense because you have your carpet, you have got your dining room table, and you've got various other pieces that would be used to ornament and um, make the room pretty. So a very different type of collector to our first type of collector. So let's look at some of the pieces that we have here. So I'm going to hand back to you, Vanessa, on this one. Well, I thought if, if, if one could use perhaps the idea that this would be a, a curiosity cabinet. It is a, um, a secretaire bookcase, but you could have uh, had wonderful curiosities in the upper section, which has got shelves and drawers. And no doubt with no, it was, uh, did have various oddities in, in those cabinets, including lots of papers and documents. But I think this is a very nice example. Um, and very, it's, it's got uh, classical elements and, it's also got this Rococo base, slightly Rococo base. And um, if one looks at the next slide, uh, Matthew. Uh, so there's this wonderful candy, um, which is Ming. Um, it's a, uh, for anybody who doesn't know what a candy is, it's a drinking vessel with a long neck. Um, it's actually a Malay term. It's a Malay word, candy. And they were made during the 14th century, right through to, we've seen 19th century examples. And this is a particularly nice one on the left-hand side, very soft, pale, um, underglazed blue decoration. Um, and on the right-hand side, you've got this very typical Japanese Amari dish uh, from the Meiji period, which is um, 1868, about 1912. And it's a very dense decoration. So you've got the simplicity of the Chinese Ming on the left and the very joyous, robust decoration on the right-hand side of the Japanese porcelain from the 19th century. These are just a few details of this, that lovely piece. Again, Sophie Louise and I always look at condition. You can see there's a hairline crack and there are a few chips to the, the garlic-shaped mouth. And but all, all of those, um, are some are acceptable, some less, so it depends on the collector's taste and how pure, the, what, what kind of how p the purest point of view. So it brings us to a piece of Chinese mm -hmm. silver, which is really lovely. Um, this is a tea caddy and it is it's about 15 centimeters high and decorated in high relief with prunus blossoms and you can see the bird in front and if we go to the next slide it's just what we thought would be quite interesting possibly is to put in some of the aspects again that we look at when we are examining a piece of um, silver for example so you can see that the solder on the top right hand image there's extensive solder there you can also look at the base, so you'll see the markings of the piece. That's quite important, um, who the maker was. And in this instance, um, it was Lewin Wall from 1880 to 1950 was where he was working in that period. But then what we also look for are um, lists and dents and all of that. So the image on the right shows you this is quite a dent. But what's really interesting with Chinese silver versus, for example, English silver, silver even continental silver is um, it doesn't seem to make a huge uh, difference in the price um, where how, in terms of the condition of the piece, especially if you're looking at dents. So an English um, coffee pot that comes in and is dented, is, it has a huge effect on the value. Whereas with this little tea caddy, for example, it won't really affect the value at all. Um, it just shows you how the Chinese market has grown 
um, and how desirable it has become. Um, and it's lovely to see Chinese silver um, because we don't see as much of it. I mean, Vanessa, you would, you would have seen a lot more of the time you, you've been in the industry. But they are also so beautifully detailed. Um, and just the workmanship that goes into them is just something else. So it's just some of the angles that we look at when we, when we um, get these pieces in and some of the discussion points that we had. The next slide brings us to the last collection that we're going to look at, um, that of the late Lady Ina Oppenheimer, the Bluebird Farm collection. Um, she was known as Caroline Harvey, and she, they actually got married in 1935. Um, Ernest Oppenheimer was a person mayor of Kimberley, and he was also knighted in 1921, and we mostly know him as the chairman of the Beers. Um, on to the next slide, we will see part of the Bluebird Farm, so it lies at the foot of the Mahalisberg, and it is from this estate that the items come that we have on offer in the third session. So over onto the next slide. These are some of the pieces we have on offer, and I think again you can see it's a little bit more of a, um, although it is a wide approach, it has a little bit um, more of a specific, that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but a specific approach as well, because um, there's a collection of treen, and treen, of course, is something that is a very specific collector would only want to own, um, and we don't often see them coming to market at all. But quite nice just to see all the pieces together, and I think it does give you a sense of the collector and what they were looking at in their lifetime. And of course, bearing in mind, this is just a small snippet of what, what there is. So on the left hand side, we've got this beautiful amwa, um, which actually was in Ernest Oppenheimer's office. Um, and to the right, we've got this fabulous iron, fire iron grate, which was made by Kurt Jobs and was made specifically for the Bluebird Farm. And you've got these cobras standing up um, with these tongues sticking out. Um, it's quite an exquisite piece and uh, it's really heavy. <laughs> It's worth, it's worth listing if, if that's what you're looking for. The next slide takes us onto the treen. And perhaps Vanessa, before we, we go oh, into the treen, could you maybe let us know what, yeah, what you saw in the house? It, well, when I went into the drawing room on the right-hand side were, the, were these large cabinets. Um, slightly old-fashioned but they were, had glazed tops and then you were able to peer into the cabinets and look at these little objects of um, inside so in a way uh, this was a, a 1950s 1960s uh, treen, a, a curiosity cabinet but this was Lady uh, Oppenheimer's interpretation and things that she was interested in yeah, and it is, it's, it's quite special, the treen. So if we go to the next slide, you can see some of the pieces, and we'll just briefly run through them. Um, but the example on the left, the 386 is a little um, spool vase, and it actually unscrews. Um, the two nutcrackers, of course, also have a screw mechanism, and you've, you've actually got to think of these items as all being handmade on a lathe. So the, the detail is quite exquisite, and um, if you think of the hours of work that must have gone into making them, I think that's what personally I enjoy about the treen. They're all quite small pieces also, so the, the little vase is about between 10 and 15 centimeters. I don't have the exact measurement in front of me, but the point of it is, is that it's quite small compared to if you had a normal, um, or three that could fit a normal vase or standing in your home. These are just a few of the other objects, cheese scoop, um, but a, a citrus squeezer, when you think about using that every day in your home in the old good old days. Um, and we, what we've done is we've grouped them, so we can just run through the slides, Matthew. We've grouped them into different um, sets which make sense for us. So the snuff boxes are all together um, with the PK work on the boot. Um, the next slide would show the nutmeg graters, and then we've got another um, nutcracker in the form of an acorn. And these nutcrackers would have also different sizes would have been used for different types of nuts. 
And perhaps another thing one should mention is all of these different woods were used throughout. So you had boxwood, you had pigment vitae, you had walnut being used. Um, so it's really quite a specific area from that point of view. If you run to the next slide, you've got your, maybe Vanessa, would you like to talk about the sermon watch glass? Oh, no, well, oh, I love this, <laughs> these objects here. I mean, on the right hand side is a pair of bellows and there's this tiny little pencil, uh, propelling pencil. And on the um, left hand side, You've got um, games, uh, dice. Um, the dice is made of bone and inlaid with uh, ebony. I mean, extraordinary, the little top hat. To, you know, they're just such fun pieces. And as Sophie Louise said, beautifully turned. And then the next slide is... Oh, the, the, these you are have fun. to explain to everyone, please, the missing well, sheets. I had me completely puzzled when I saw them. Yeah, no, they were. They, you know, you look at those and you think, good Lord, what is that? But they, they were used for knitting and you put each um, arm under your arm and the, then the chain obviously united them under your, your tummy and you knitted. Um, quite extraordinary. Uh, they were actually scary, weren't they? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And then the bobbins at the bottom, that was quite interesting that each each had a different color, wasn't it? And then as you, you could yes. see the side which, which thread was where. Absolutely. And, and those are all Venetian glass. So you, um, they're hand blown uh, little tiny balls of Venetian glass. Uh, they're all 18th century. So you knew exactly where you are, were on which line. Hmm. Yeah, quite extraordinary. So the next Screen. Let's see what that brings. So here we just have, in conclusion, um, the three collections again, just for you to absorb. So that's the property of a collector. The next one is the uh, late Graham and Rona Beck Kangaroo Group collection, and then the last one, the Oppenheimer or late Lady, you know, Oppenheimer Bluebird Farm collection. So three distinctive different collections. And it brings us to the next slide, which comes back to what we were asking in the beginning, is the cabinet of curiosity obsolete in the 21st century or has it been replaced? And on the left hand side is a picture from the Maison des Rolles in Paris, which was found in 1821. And there you can see one of these cabinets with all these fabulous objects and pieces and curiosities and then and the giraffe. And if we go to the next slide, and we think of the 21st century and where we are today. Um, sorry, it's just sticking on my side. There we go. We have Damien Hirst, and of course, he produced all these um, animals in these perspex cases um, of formaldehyde, I think it was. And that would be the equivalent of the modern day. Um, cabinet of curiosity from an animal point of view. So the question really is, has it been, yeah, is the cabinet of curiosity, has it changed, has it evolved, or has it been replaced by social media and its global village? I don't know, Vanessa, if you'd like to add anything to it at all. Well, what I find so fascinating is that um, if you go, if you think that the Maison de Rôle is uh, was founded in 1821 and, and is still uh, operational today and if you look at that slide look at those objects there's coral there's shells there's bones there's starfish um they you know I, I really don't think people have given up on these curiosities and whether they fill them with those beautiful objects um all the examples that we have uh, on the next slide of these modern extraordinary curiosities um, I think each person in their own way has their own curiosity cabinet, which they refer to. It, uh, yeah, I don't think the idea of collecting and having curiosity cabinets has really changed that much. It's just um, perhaps a different way of looking at objects. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, it's quite, a, I mean, it's a very interesting um 
conversations to have, and I'm sure um, as the conversation evolves, there are lots of opinions, and it can get probably quite um, quite heated, possibly. But Matthew, involving you into this, as as having listened to our lecture, would you say what would your opinion be? So, so I, I suppose I, I've got one or two thoughts, but let me let me hold off first because we've got a question that's come in, um, and um, we. Oh, um, yes. Okay. So we've got a question. Um, do you, and it's about the VOC, VOC items, and they were saying, um, do you, is there an estimate or sort of an idea of inventory of how many uh, VOC items ever came to South Africa, um, whether there was a prodigious trade, mm. um, and were they widespread in the Cape? Um, you know, were they, were they and, and I suppose just an extension of the, that question is, were they used? What was their function at the at the time of at, at their point of origin, and how has that use changed to be a collectible item now? They were definitely used, uh, Matt. Um, large dinner services and charges were ordered, and the VOC and uh, for their dinner parties and the cha and uh, with, within the chambers, they definitely used them, and the Chinese dinner services were ordered for there were examples ordered for the cape some of them have memorials and um, which you can see at Coopman's de Vet house in strand street in cape town so and also the um the Clouty family ordered their own uh dinner service with their memorial so yes they were around and they were they could be ordered through the merchants and through the company so the question is, were there a lot around? I think at the time they were obviously quite, there must have been quite good examples, but obviously dissipated with time and with uh, family divisions. Um, and of course, normal wear and tear and damage. And I think to add to that, the question is, um, why have they probably changed? It was changed in value, hasn't it? From well, and I suppose it's changed in, changed in use. I suppose it's quite interesting with these objects that accrue, you know, as you said, you know, we're looking at 17th century examples. So those examples are now two, 300 years old, how they, how they use changes from a, from a, 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 a sort of dinnerware to now sort of highly collectible historical object. Yeah. And I mean, that's a whole discussion for itself, I guess, because if you look at the basis of collecting is why, why are people so fascinated with these objects? You know, whether it's a Chinese bowl, whether it's the Cape chair, whether it's the VOC chair, why? What is, what is the human fascination with this? And I suppose part of that could be is that we're just interested in our history, you know, what, what were people doing however many years ago? Um, and why were they doing that? And with that, how does one attach a monetary value? And I mean, that brings another discussion with it. Um, how do we decide as a human race almost um, what has value and what doesn't? So from a collecting point of view, I think really it is your own personal interest. What do you enjoy? What do you collect? Obviously, there's a market that creates a need for those things or the perceived idea that these have a value. And, and, and that is created throughout not only the art world, that's created out, you know, throughout with other properties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and within that, then, yes, things do become collectible and rare and prized, et cetera. And I think as long as you have someone who, who is willing to come and engage and look and say, wow, what a fantastic piece. There will always be someone who will go, I have to have it. And that's how you, in my opinion, you create the, the buying, selling, mm -hmm. um, collecting, enjoyment, environment. And, and that's why I think collecting also goes through its cycles historically as well, because tastes change, people change, opinions change. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we learn more, we forget more, we learn it again, and it all goes around in stories, yeah. It's um, also a gen generational, you know, one doesn't want what one's parents had. <laughs> one wants to strike out, as you know, on our last uh, slide, you want to strike out and make your own mark. Um, and sometimes you won't want your parents' uh, objects. You want, as a collector, something earlier. Um, so it's really, it, it just depends on the individual. Mm. I, I suppose the the the... I think it's quite fascinating. I've always associated, uh, I've always associated uh, the VOC where with um, kind of exclusively Japanese 
um, work um, because uh, because that was you know the the Dutch were the the only the only country to be able to trade with Japan for um, was it two hundred years? Just correct me if I was wrong. Well, they were trading in the seventeenth century, yeah, so, and earlier, and 16th, so, 17th century. What is you know when we're looking? I mean, it was it was really it was really fascinating to see the two examples of the VOC where where you said you know you've got one distinctly uh, distinctly Japanese or well, three Japanese um, examples, and then the mm -hmm. Chinese the, the the stylistic difference in the Chinese uh, after that when it's pointed out to you really um, jumps out at you. It's uh, it's it's quite fascinating that that I suppose opened um, opened up a. a open my eyes to to the differences in period mm. yeah they, they're very different and once you've seen that it's everything to do with the porcelain the firing um and uh the, the decoration the lightness of hand and the strength of the hand they're completely different and it, of course it's a, a national um it's a japanese uh, intellect and uh, the others, obviously, the very commercial Chinese mass producing um, objects into the 19th century. I see. Um, oh, we just uh, uh, had a response. Thank you very much. Wonderful answers. Thanks. That's uh, always nice to get some feedback. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask um, for any any other questions um, that we might have um, to to uh, for Sophie Louise and uh, uh, Vanessa? Um, we're just uh, talking a little bit about uh, the notion of the curiosity cabinet and uh, its I suppose its origins and longevity into the 21st century. Um, quite quite interestingly, just extending that logic of um, these sort of three three on the surface similar collections, but once you delve once you delve into the 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 nuances of the objects and um, and the focus of that kind of collecting, um, you know, it really starts to become quite um, distinct from each other in the in the you know sort of a exceptional focus for instance of the in the in the in the property of a collector with the voc works and then the quite sort of broad and established kind of collecting that you've got uh in um in the 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 kangaroo group um, property of uh, uh, rona and graham beck um speak to me a little bit about how how somebody begins to venture out into b building like a, a collection like the the, the voc collection is it is it sometimes um, more valuable as a collection together, or um, you know, is that why? Is that why I suppose it's been it's been grouped that way? That is definitely more valuable, don't you agree, Sophie Louise? Yeah, definitely. It's, I mean, we we don't see a lot of VOC coming to market, and now you're getting this this really comprehensive collection coming. Um, so it's quite special from that point of view. I mean, I was really excited when it came through the doors. I was like, wow, what do we have here? Um, and I suppose that's why we also group, as you said, group these, the different pieces in those slides so that you actually got a sense of, of what was going on with it, within each of these collecting um, collective sides, I suppose. So Vanessa, you wanted to say something? Oh, well, I was just going to say that that VOC collection is, um, has, the collect has been collecting for over 30 years with such dedication and passion. And uh, you can see that in all the objects that he's put together. He sought out the best objects that he could at the time. And it's that driven excitement that the collector has. I think that's your answer, Matt. You can't explain it. You just know, you know, the collector is a diseased person. <laughs> they can't help themselves. Once they um, set their minds on something, they are resolute and they just, they have to have that object. And for interest's sake, the, the object that got away is always the one that haunts them. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, <laughs> the fun sides of the, the collector's psyche. And I think also one needs to remember, you know, um, is it a collector that's been collecting themselves or have they had other people buy on their behalf? And that also makes a difference. You know, if, you, if you're getting someone in to buy on your behalf and you give them a brief, this is what I want. It, all those various aspects make, give each collection its own nuance, basically. Mm -hmm. 
I suppose it's these filters that are applied to the objects and the way that and the purpose that they're filled and um, you know and how they occupy people's lives and imaginations really. Um, and just an interesting question, and I suppose one for my my own naivety and um, for the benefit of uh, the benefit of our, some of our viewers and listeners. Why why does um, why is there such a scarcity of um, VOC work on the market? Is it because it's been majority of it has been sold and is in just in, in happy collections, or is it become quite rare because, as you said, of wear and damage and just sheer it doesn't exist anymore. Matt, Matt, it's always been rare. I mean, you just have to visit our national museum and just go to the castle. And, um, you know, there's always been this intense interest in the VOC in the Cape. And your question was, you know, why don't we see a lot of it? Is, is that what you're mm -hmm. questioning? Even in England, um, you don't see a lot of uh, VOC wares. Uh, there are dedicated museums and collectors. And I think you will find that the VOC porcelain, the price will go, keep continue going higher because the collectors of Japanese wares, they're not allowed to trade in, in the Japanese ivories anymore. So they've turned their attentions from the Netskis and gone, and they're much more interested in uh, porcelain now. So there's going to be a, a market, I think, some sort of a rise in the next, definitely we've seen in the last six months, collectors are looking at porcelain again, be it Satsuma um, or Japanese VOC, where, because they can't collect the other particular fields, being ivory. So, so we've got another question that's just come in. Um, it's time from uh, Carla Lewis, and she says, in a digital age um, which every, um, in which everything seems so fleeting, do you think that these objects offer us a bit of visceral grounding, both to our history um, regarding the VOC plate and also, also on a sensory level? So I suppose um, uh, what Carl is asking is, you know, what kind, of, what kind of visceral grounding do you think these objects offer us, both to our history and to the sheer senses of being around these things? I think they just remind us of, of another period and of, of our history. And there is, I mean, there is something special about holding a piece, um, you know, especially if it's rare. You, you, it's just it's, it's something you can't explain. It's, you just feel so privileged to hold it and have it and handle it and look at it. And I think that's what encourages the looking of these pieces as well. So it's definitely a way of, of grounding us in, in the here and now and allowing that brain to start absorbing and working and, and opening it almost up to looking. And, and with that, yeah, obviously you're touching and feeling. And, and I think part of the pleasure, um, and I think a lot of collectors have that pleasure, it's like they're little babies. You know, they've looked after for them so long. They've gone into cabinets. They're normally pristine. Um, you know, they get shown at special occasions and we have a whole discussion about them. And, and it's lovely because it, it really becomes a conversation piece. And in that way, it's another way of bringing people together, sharing the interests, spreading the interests out there. And I think it's really important to, to have those or that experience. So I think in conclusion, um, I think we're making our cases, uh, we're making our cases uh, for the, the Curiosity Cabinet and <laughs> The 21st century. Um, v, can we have a, can we have um, your, your sort of closing thoughts? Um, I've got a, I've also just got a, a one more question. Um, uh, um, well, I'm, I've got, I, uh, you know, be, before we had this lovely discussion, Matt, you, 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 you showed us a side of your secret collecting. Yes. Mm. Yes, we, want, <laughs> you want, we love that. You would definitely qualify as a 17th century collector. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. So Mike, Mike, very quickly, I've got uh, I collect um, bricks from bodies of uh, bricks from that have been altered by bodies of water. So this is a stone collected in um, the Table Bay Harbour, and um, uh, and then uh, these are pieces of archway collected from dams in the Midlands of KwaZulu Natal, and these are you can see the tapered edge means that it's come from an arch so um, and those were 
And when buildings were knocked down, the rubble was used in the construction of dams. Um, so, you know, to, to sort of soak up a bit of the clay at the bottom of a dam. So these are wonderful, wonderful objects from, from clay. Um, I just see we've got a comment um, from, um, from Wilhelm. Um, Wilhelm, would you like to, it's quite a, 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 it's quite a, a long one. So would you like to come and unmute, come and join the conversation? I'm just going to unmute you here. Yeah. There we are. Hi, Wilhelm. Yeah, uh, hi, yeah, um, a very interesting talk uh, on uh, the Dutch 17th century and it reminded me very much of uh, some wonderful exhibitions I've seen uh, at uh, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. The, the uh, foremost one was in 2015 when Alette and I were there uh, and it had a wonderful title called Asia and the mathematical symbol of uh, larger than Amsterdam, uh, looking at the trade between Asia and Amsterdam. Uh, and the other uh, a wonderful thing that the Rijksmuseum Museum does is uh, it mounts these regular exhibitions. It's obviously under the auspices of the history department, where they look at the colonial history of, uh, um, of uh, the Dutch colonies. Uh, and uh, at the moment, they have published, uh, you know, uh, South Africa and the Netherlands, Japan and the Netherlands, uh, Ghana and the Netherlands, Suriname, um, uh, Sri Lanka. And it is a wonderful series, uh, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, thick catalogs accompanying these wonderful things. So you can see the whole culture and the trade and the exchange and the influences uh, in, uh, in those books. Gosh, Phil Hallam, uh, and uh, can one access these uh, through the Rakes Museum? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. All uh, they, they, they are wonderful hard, uh, hardcover copies. These catalogues, and uh, they are very resourceful, uh, focusing on early periods. You know, as you say, seventeen and eighteenth, uh, uh, a little bit of nineteenth century, but uh, very detailed uh, with wonderful photographs wonderful artwork, and of course, all these uh, uh, fascinating items that uh, you and uh, Sophie Louise discussed today. Oh, well, thanks, Phil Helen. And I, I see we've got a raised hand here um, from Susie. Hi, Susie, thanks for joining uh, us. No, well, I love that. I think um, maybe Vanessa and Sophie Louise the, and Matt and Bill Helen, I, I think maybe the core of why we love this business that we're involved in is the curiosity of these wonderful things. But my note that I wanted to add is that I also think that that whole grand, well, the grand tourist collection of the sort of 1700s in England with all those amazing English homes where they went off to and brought back souvenirs, as you were mentioning, of travels, mm -hmm. you know, when you go into some of those homes, I mean, whether they're national trust or privately, they, the curiosity that you find in the libraries of, you know, bits of um, mosaic from Vesuvius and, and all of those wonderful things just draw you into another world that we just don't have in our life. And I think we are so becoming more minimalists or becoming more modernized or whatever we are, but it's such a treasure when you experience these objects like you both given us this afternoon. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Susie. No, absolutely, and I think um, you know, in a, in 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 our sort of conclusion, to say that the one of the one of the really one of the wonders of uh, one of the wonders of these um, Zoom Zoom talks has been bringing the objects alive because I think um, that when you know it's fine to it's fine to see an object, but I suppose as Sophie Louise was um, suggesting in the introduction that looking is an art in and of itself. And to really look is to, to look at the cataloging, to examine the object from all sides, to examine the history of the object, to understand the many filters um, that, uh, that, that the object uh, presents and can, um, can be looked at through. So, um, you know, I, I wanna just say thank you so much again to uh, Sophie Louise and Vanessa Phillips um, for, for joining us today and really, again, Bringing the bringing sessions two and three uh, uh, alive in the, in all of its wonder, and these are some really spectacular um, uh, connections that uh, Strauss and Co are privileged enough to handle. Um, just uh, before before we go, um, whilst we've got uh, uh, um, you on the on the on the line, do you just want to tell um, tell everybody um, when we can um, how the auction will be will be running? These sessions two and three will be running on Monday. 
um, and we'll be closing the lots online on our um, on our invaluable platform. Okay. Oh, no. Well, Sophie Louise, you're going to be the auctioneer, I hope. <laughs> so you could tell, tell them a little bit about it. I think I'm going to hand over to Susie on this one. She's a little bit more concise. <laughs> okay. Um, it's very exciting that we can offer a virtual live auction through partnership with Invaluable. Um, so we will have a live auctioneer. Um, and you, the website is, you can bid through, you can go onto our website now and click through to bid and register. And I encourage you all to register well in advance. Um, and you can look, you can tag the lot that you're interested in. So you can have a sort of hit list. Um, you can place bids now. The bidding is open and, and, and alive and kicking. Um, and then on the day of the sale, you can bid from the comfort of your home, either through the carousel or, or on the, the invaluable app that they provide. So you can bid in real time, or you can leave an absentee bid and, and we'll offer some very limited telephone bidding where we can. Um, but it's very exciting because it just means that we can reach a wider audience, even though we're in lockdown, we can bid from home, um, we can bid overseas. Um, so all of these things are here to help us reach the people who want to collect these delicious things and add them to their collection. Um, if you need any help on bidding or how to bid, please do contact us. We're all here um, up and ready and waiting for, for, for any help that's needed. Thanks, Thanks. Susie. Yeah, thank you so much, Suze. That's fantastic. And just to reiterate Susie's point as well, please, ladies and gentlemen, if you are having any trouble with um, logging on um, and, and, uh, and if you want to place any bids, please don't hesitate to contact us. Contact one of the specialists or in, reach out to uh, ct at straussart.co.za or jhb at straussart.co.za or, or look for our, one of our contact, um, uh, our contact details on our staff, um, staff tab on our website. Um, and we, all of our all of our details are there. So please don't hesitate to contact one of us um, if you if you know one of us or if you prefer the face of one of us. Um, just give us a shout, and we can we can give you a we can give you a, a hand from there. So again, thank you so much for coming, Vanessa and uh, Sophie Louise. Thanks so much, and Suze, thanks for giving us an update on uh, on on Monday. We're very excited. So um, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, Matthew. Bye. Thanks, Matthew. And we have